Hello. Uh, today I want to begin a little study of Sartre and uh, we will look at a, a reasonable portion of this book, uh, Being a Nothingness, and, uh, and we'll end up with a study of a little bit of this book, The Critique of Dialectical Reason. Um, we won't, they're both very big books, very long books. We won't go through either one of them as a whole or in detail. But what I imagine I can do through a series of lectures is uh, take you on a path through them that lets you get the basic thing that's being said in them. And I think that um, if you get this argument, not, I mean, not only will you get the point of the books, but you'd also be very well positioned to go on and uh, read any of the other parts of the, of the book uh, on your own. Uh, anyway, but uh, so I want, I want to start with being in nothingness. But before uh, jumping into the text, I want us to look at a picture. Uh, this I want to look at this picture. This is uh, the uh, expulsion of the money changers from the temple by Luca Giordano from uh, about 1675. Um, and I want you to look at this because uh, you know it's a it's a picture of a of a real human situation, a kind of thing that can happen, the situation of action in particular. Uh, and and I want us to think about action, what it's like to do something, and and so to to. To do that, I want you to look at a particular guy here. Um, I want you to look at the guy who's uh, running away there holding his little sort of wicker tray that has uh, looks like shells on it or maybe pearls, um, and he's taken off. Uh, and I want you to put yourself in his position. Imagine you were that guy. Uh, you know, so there, there he is, and you think about what he's doing, and, and think about what he's doing, but especially think about what his experience is, what his consciousness is in this context. You know, so if you were that guy, if you could suddenly go inside that body and get behind those eyes and be in that situation, you know, what what would that be? Well, he, he, it seems to me, experiences a threat. There's this guy coming at him with a stick who's obviously pretty angry. So one thing is. You know, I think I think when someone comes at you in anger, let let alone the the threat of violent action, just anger in general, it's very hard not to immediately get sort of emotionally worked up yourself. Um, so I imagine that that guy is uh, experiencing a real a real uh, emotional charge of that rush of angry feeling, and it's directed to be directed at Jesus here. Uh, and, you know, you can think about what that's like, what it feels like to be angry, and how you perceive a situation in that context. And indeed, one thing is, he, like, he might even either be thinking or saying out loud some nasty swear words, you know, uh, which I don't need to repeat on the recording, but you can imagine what, what might be coming out of his slightly open mouth there. Um, and you think about what it's like to swear at someone in that situation. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's not so much that you sat down and, composed an essay and then delivered it like a formal speech. It's more like these words of anger just come out of your mouth pretty much immediately as a kind of discharge of that angry feeling. Um, they're almost part of the same thing, like to feel anger. Almost part of what that is, is to say and express these grumpy uh, denunciations of the other person. Anyway, so that's one thing, the way he'd be feeling. But then the other thing is he's taken off, right? He's running away. You can tell by his posture that that's not just his comfortable standing posture like he's he's running from the stick that's coming at him and uh and he's looking back over his shoulder seeing the threatening guy that's coming at him and while he's doing that he's he's sort of getting ready to run off he's in the process of running off in another direction he's holding onto his plate with his thing so he doesn't drop them right um he's also got his coat draped over his draped over his arm too and around his body i guess his cloak something like that um but you know think about that too right while he is looking back you know, i sort of dis defensively i guess and somewhat curiously at this attacking guy and while he's addressing him angrily assuming that's what's happening and feeling that flood of anger he's also making his way out of that space um by moving his legs you know and holding onto that plate and that also is not entirely uh, straightforward, right? There's looks like there's some little baby sheep or something under his feet. Like there's a lot of things in the way. There's a, a woman or he, someone has knocked over the table. Maybe Jesus knocked over the table, and that woman is sort of charging through there too. And there's another guy coming carrying his big bag of stuff. Uh, and there's a, you know there's a lot of commotion, and and so it's like um, 
a psychologically and experientially complex situation, which includes physical obstacles to his movement, right? So again, picture yourself in that situation and picture what he's like in that situation. What's, what's striking, it seems to me, is of anyone who's in a situation like that is, you know, he's able, he's, he's, he's competent, right? He's able to move himself out of there, right? put his feet down, hold on to that plate in, in a comfortable way and so on, you know, in a, in a way that doesn't spill it while looking back to make sure he isn't getting hit and yelling at Jesus and so on. Um, his attention, so think about what his attention is on there and what his experience is like, right? It seems to me his attention is focused on the, the, the salient feature, which is the threat. You know, a minute ago he was, you know, making a business deal with someone. That's that's a million miles from his mind right now. And he's like, ah, oh, that guy's coming at me. Um, and so the, that has, you know, risen to the forefront of his experience. And he responds to that by, you know, in this angry feeling that, that itself gets discharged in this uh, expletive or whatever. And it's immediately taken up by him grabbing that dish and sort of running off, you know, and, and making his way uh, across the across the whatever you call it, the court there. Um, you know, it's a, so again, I just try to say, like, what what's what's his what's his experience about? Well, it's about that threat and responding to it. And, there, you know, it's no longer about the deal he was making before. There's probably lots of stuff he doesn't notice, right? We can sit there and notice the cow behind Jesus or the guy with the red hat holding on to it. We can see the building sort of in the distance. Probably those things are not things he's noticing at all. You know, they would still all be having a physiological effect on, on his eyes, you know. But, but that's not what he's seeing. You know, that's not what he's aware of. His, for him... The situation is a situation of a threatening guy, and I got to get away. That's kind of what it means, and his behavior is is a response to those needs. And to do that, you know, it's it's like his body. He doesn't he doesn't have to sit and think. How am I going to bend my elbow now and use my fingers to hold on to this dish? And how am I going to move my knees and my hips and my ankle to make my body go the way I want it to go? Um, he, he doesn't need to do that. His body basically rises to the task right as soon as he sees what's coming like his his arms reach down and grab that plate and his legs start to, his hips start turning his legs start moving his head goes around to watch the threat like all that stuff happens like that uh, without uh, reflective calculation or planning right those things sort of rise to this emergent challenge uh, f uh, almost like you know iron filings would sort of um, get attracted to a magnet when the magnet shows up right Th those things his, his, he wasn't doing those things before. That's not how his hands and hips and so on were engaged five minutes before when he was talking to someone about a business deal, or, or I should say five seconds before. But as soon as this threat comes, that's when it's like the iron filings and the magnet, right? Suddenly the body just uh, um, rises to action uh, out, of a, out of a kind of resting state almost. And uh, all, of that, all of that behavior um, kind of almost automatically follows from the perception of that threat sort of like i was imagining those words fly out of his or someone's mouth in a situation of anger um so i want to look at another one so you know that that i've said basically the thing i want to say there but but at the same time most of us probably have not been in that situation of uh running away from the money table while jesus is coming at us with a stick um so i wanted to see if i could find a picture of of um something else that's a little more familiar. And so I looked at this one. This is a Hendrik to Bruggen, a man playing a lute from about 1624. I picked this one just because I think probably a lot of people have done some kind of performing, especially musical, um, playing a piano, playing a guitar, singing. Um, but, you know, this would also be true if you were playing volleyball or playing hockey, um, dance, uh, in a skateboard or uh, snowboarding competition whatever you know but it's just a, a situation where you sort of have to perform the thing i'm thinking about here is with the with the and with this lute player or with singing is uh when when you're actually in the situation of performing it seems to me your experience is quite a bit like that sort of experience i was just describing of the guy running away from the money table you know i play guitar uh, sometimes and uh you know, if, if my band has a gig uh, before that, like five minutes before it, I might be thinking about stuff. I might be thinking about w wondering. I might be wondering, am I going to play well tonight or am I going to play poorly? Because, you know, you can't, don't entirely know. And I might be um, 
thinking i might be thinking about something technical about playing i don't know um i could be nervous i could be planning what i'm going to do you know i'm i'm i am reflecting on probably uh, i'm reflecting on the experience of playing and its various dimensions and having views about it and trying to plan things out you know but that experience that that's a way of experiencing playing it's experiencing it by sort of reflecting on it from a distance it's very different from the experience of doing it you know, somebody counts in the tune, you know, one, two, one, two, and then the downbeat comes in. Well, as soon as the song starts, uh, I'm caught up. I'm absorbed in playing it. If I'm not, they're just going to throw me off the stage, right? The, I don't get to count as a musician if I don't actually play. You know, once once that song starts, the thing that's on my mind is, in a way, analogously to what I was saying about the guy who's got the thread of Jesus on his mind. What's on my mind is the song that's unfolding and the things the other people are playing, right? So I hear the music happening that the, the drummer and the bass player or whatever else are, are producing. I hear their music and I experience that as the unfolding of a song that dictates to me certain needs, right? Both the, the, the larger project of the executing of that song as a whole and the immediate circumstances of what's being played you know, are like the two axes of a some sort of coordinate system that say, okay, this is what you got to respond to, and I, I have to play something at that moment. And my attention is really focused on on that. Like that's I I, I no longer could tell you who's sitting uh, at the tables in the bar watching us or whether someone's noticing or uh, that sort of stuff. Like the my experience, even though all that stuff's there, my experience is. The unfolding of the song, but not also not in the way it is for an audience member exactly. It's the unfolding of the song as a kind of imperative structure, as a kind of a thing I'm participating in that that puts to me tasks that I need to respond to. Um, I don't know if you've never played music live or never sung a song live. You you might you might not immediately recognize yourself or your experience in that description of the absorption of actually executing this thing but but if you've ever been in a conversation you probably have that experience you know if you think of yourself where you when you're really wrapped up in a conversation right when you're really um not when you're just sitting back listening or but but where you're in a serious conversation that and you're excited about it right uh or maybe maybe go back to that kind of angry thing maybe if you're arguing with someone um there, there are situations, very common ones, it seems to me, where in a conversation, you are committed to its unfolding, and that's what's on your mind. And um, you, you talk or 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 don't talk, you know, kind of uh, in the, in that immediate sense of dealing with what is called for by the unfolding of that situation. Um, and there's not. I guess the real thing I want to say there is there's a lot of absorption there. There's not a lot of detached reflection. I mean, sometimes there are moments of that. Sometimes when I'm playing, you know, I'm, I'm having some thoughts about the musical structure of the song or whatever. And uh, sometimes in a conversation, often in a conversation, you know, I'm also thinking about the things I want to say. But it's not, it's not really detached, um, calm reflection in, in, in the way... You can sit here right now and think about how you'd like to behave in a conversation someday. It's it it's really uh, f you know fast thinking that's in the service of um, carrying out the role that's 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 playing right now. And and the thing is, you like you you have to act right now in the conversation or in the music or whatever. Uh, and and that's sort of the point I was trying to make about the downbeat. Right, once the song starts, like it's happening and you're doing, and uh, and you're you're a participant in that thing and caught up in the flow of it no matter no matter what you know if if you're actually if you're actually doing it anyway i just wanted to look at those things um as a way to get you to start um to get us to start thinking about what it's like to do and what, it, what it's like to to act uh, and with with that i want to now to turn to being a nothingness and i want to read uh, what i think is uh, a really good uh sentence to start the book with. So I'm going to read from page 74 of this Hazel Barnes translation. Uh, not the greatest translation. You don't have a lot of options though, but it's not the greatest translation. I might tell you a little bit later about some things I really dislike in the way she did it. But anyway, that's what we're going to read. 
Uh, so page 74, uh, line 6, Sartre says this. He says, The consciousness of man in action is non-reflective consciousness. It is consciousness of something, and the transcendent, that thing it's of, right? The transcendent which discloses itself to this consciousness is of a particular nature. It is a structure of exigency. Exigency means, you know, needs, necessities. It's a structure of ex exigency in the world. And the world correlatively discloses in it complex relations of instrumentality. Um, I'll read you a little bit more now from the skip to almost the bottom of 75, uh, eight lines up from the bottom. At each instant, we are thrust into the world and engaged there. This means that we act before positing, before explicitly thinking about it, you know, and, and focusing on, before positing our possibilities. And then he gives an example, the line, three lines from the bottom. He says, the alarm that rings in the morning refers to the possibility of my going to work. And that is my possibility, but I don't think of it that way, right? But to apprehend the summons of the alarm as a summons is to get up. And therefore, the very act of getting up is, is actually reassuring, and it eludes the question, is work my possibility, right? And what he means by that is, you experience it as a necessity that you have to respond to. You don't, you don't experience it as saying, well, you know, you could get up, you could decide whether or not to re respond to it. it, it the, that would be a reflective response. Generally speaking, that's not the way uh, that you that you act. You you normally experience the situation as a kind of exigency that you grasp by feeling the necessity and responding to it. And so I want to just read one more uh, line, uh, and this is from the bottom of page 76, five lines up from the bottom. The immediate is the world with its urgency. Right? And that, so that's what he basically was saying, right? The consciousness of man in action is consciousness of something, namely of a structure of exigency. Right? That's the same as saying the immediate is the world with its urgency. Uh, so it seems to me that those sentences I've just described from Sartre say, in a, in a concise and precise way, the basic thing I was trying to get at in describing, trying to describe the experience of the guy running away from Jesus or the guy playing the lute or you performing, me performing, that, that our, our immediate, um, the immediate form our experience takes is that we're, in, in everyday life, is that we're doing something. And that means our experience is of a situation. We're wrapped up in a situation which is presenting us with exigencies, needs that call upon us for a response. And that structure, the, the thread I need to get away from or the song I need to play, uh, has as its kind of f uh, form of presentation that it sort of reveals the world in terms of the relevant for lack of a better word, resources uh, for dealing with it, right? So the, and, that, and that's what I was saying about the guy, the money changer, and I was using the image of the iron filings uh, showing up for the magnet. There I was saying his body kind of rises to action. But in, in a similar way, you could say um, that uh, it's not just his body rising to action, although that was right, but it's also a certain features in the situation suddenly become the salient ones, Um that are different than they were five minutes before when you know you were calmly talking to the guy who was buying something from you or when you were waiting for the song to start or whatever. Uh, you know, when I'm playing music, suddenly the things that are relevant are um, the pick in my finger, the strings on the guitar, um, the amplifier, whatever, the other instruments and so on. Um, and uh, so it's not just that my, my body in the sense of my wrists and my neck and my ears a rise to the challenge of, of uh, uh, facilitating my carrying out my role as a musician, but it's also that certain other sort of material dimensions, material aspects of the situation become the relevant sites for action. The, the, the guitar, the pick, the amplifier, the other saxophone, let's say, the bass, uh, whatever else is going on, you know, this PA system, um, those become the the 
material ways by which that responding to exigency is carried out. And so that's what he meant when he said uh, that uh, it's a structure of exigency in the world, and the world correlatively discloses in it complex relations of instrumentality. Right? If basically, the relevant instrumental features for responding to that thing become the ones that are experientially alive for you. So like the guy's legs when he's running, uh, but also the table that's an obstacle for him, the, the knocked over table that's in the way, or the sheep. The sheep becomes relevant, but the sheep becomes relevant as an obstacle to running, not as, oh, a thing I might shear to get some wool out of which I could eventually, uh, you know, make a jacket. Um, it's the, the relevant sense of the sheep is, is its instrumental relationship to the task of running away from the threat and its instrumental relationship is that it's an obstacle and so you got to get around it and so on um, so anyway as I said those those passages it seems to me uh, uh, that I was reading are describing in a very uh, concise way what I was describing in a kind of verbose way as I talked through those images uh, and I want to just read one more little passage from that uh, from that same little section around pages uh, 74 to 77 let's say uh, so this is kind of a summary now of, of uh, this thing we've just been saying. So this starts on page 77, uh, line 10. He says, Thus, in what we shall call the world of the immediate, which delivers itself to our unreflective consciousness, we do not first appear to ourselves to be thrown subsequently into enterprises. You don't start in this sort of private relationship with yourself and then you sort of march out into a situation. On the contrary, our being is immediately in situation. That is, uh, our being arises in enterprises and we know ourselves first insofar as who we are ourselves is reflected in those enterprises. So, as he said, we do not first appear to ourselves to be thrown subsequently into enterprises. He says, on the contrary, we discover ourselves then we discover ourselves then in a world peopled with demands in the heart of projects in the course of realization right so that's that's who i am i am the guy who's responding to this threat or i am the guy who's doing this right and those situations are uh, situations of need that tell you you know you should do this you shouldn't do this right let me skip back a little bit again i, I read the first part of this line before on 76. Point or 76, uh, five lines from the bottom. There, I said, the immediate is the world with its urgency. And in this world where I engage myself, my acts, my acts cause values to spring up like partridges, right? When somebody's, you know, hunting for partridges, you know, you shake the bushes or whatever, and they all <laughs> come flying up like that. He says, well, that's what how values come up in our lives, right? Uh, when the guy comes at you with the stick, suddenly suddenly i should get away right should a value i should get away springs up like a partridge out of the situation i should grab that thing the, the table the wicker plate with his shells and pearls on it. i should grab it those are those are uh those are values oh you should get out of the way the sheep you know whatever um shoulds pop up all over the place right um and you know they're the, the threat is a pretty intense one and even playing music is a pretty intense one but but the point is that the, these aren't he's not even just talking about extraordinary circumstances he's really talking about the everyday as you walk down the street uh, you know you the, the the basic project of walking down the street uh, makes that concrete on the ground that you call the sidewalk um, makes that show up as a kind of significance right it, because it defines a border between you and the cars that are whipping past and that would kill you if you walked in front of it and so you should um, uh, you should stay a little ways away from the curb or something like that uh, you shouldn't step out into the traffic right you don't even have to think about those things that's that's just um, a set of values that spring up like partridges a set of values that sort of immediately define the environment to which you are responding that is your immediate situation and you don't think about it you don't sit back and ponder hmm, how should I do this right the project of walking the, the practice of walking results in 
those values springing up like partridges, right? That's, that's just what immediately becomes the meaning of the situation that you navigate without even thinking about it. Right? It's not, you don't, you don't need Jesus coming at you with a stick, right? It's not like, oh, I got to be so urgent, I'm going to do this. No, I mean, you, you're so familiar with walking that you, um, you easily relate to that situation. And it is so unreflective that you don't ever even have to think about it because you can walk down the street listening to music or talking to your friend or talking on the phone, you know, or doing whatever. Uh, and you will behaviorally respond competently, intelligently to those values, to those exigencies, without ever stopping to think about it, right? Uh, and so so then he says, you know, uh, so go back to the, I, where I ended on 77. He said, we discover ourselves then in a world peopled with demands in the heart of projects in the course of realization. And then he just gives some examples of it. He says, I write, I'm going to smoke. I have an appointment this evening with Pierre. I must not forget to reply to Simon. I do not have the right to conceal any longer from uh, conceal the truth any longer from Claude. Right, that's that's sort of a description. Of, he's, pro he's probably telling the truth about what's on his mind at that moment, but who knows? Um, but the but the thing is, like that's kind of what it's like for you to inhabit any moment. Your everyday situation is you're practically enga engaged with things, and that means both the writing you're doing right now, or the walking that you're doing as you go down the street, but also your homework. Uh, and your love relationship and your neglected angry interaction with your parents or whatever you know you've got a, a set of sort of different layers of what you're doing in your life right now and your ongoing action is that kind of engagement with the exigencies of each of those situations and you know because some are more pressing and some less pressing you know, they, they sort of get dealt with in different ways. Um, so, you know, you know, you, you can't conceal the truth from Claude any longer, and that may be bugging you, but that doesn't automatically mean you're going to pick up and phone him right now. That that, 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 that may not at all be at odds with um, still walking out to buy your cup of coffee, you know, but you realize, oh, I'm going to have to do that and so on. And, but the point is, as you march through the day, the world is revealing itself to you as what he called here a situation. The world is revealing itself to you as this kind of um, nested set of uh, responsibilities or exigencies uh, that are all of which are values, value laden, uh, that reflect your practical commitments, right? um, that, uh, that really reflect your possibilities. Like they're, they're all, they're all reflective of you and how you've lived your life and what you're trying to do. But they, but they don't present themselves to you in that way. They present themselves to you as kind of immediate worldly needs to which you should respond. Um, so that's the main thing I wanted to get out of, uh, just to introduce things out of those pages. And I want to skip back now uh, to page 40, um, just to push a little bit farther with this thing I was saying, like what it's, what it's like to experience the immediate situation. And that's what we're really talking about. So let's go down now to page 40, uh, three lines from the bottom of the page. So he's just describing his situation. He says, I have an appointment with Pierre at four o'clock. So I arrive at the cafe a quarter of an hour late. Pierre is always punctual. Will he have waited for me? I look at the room, the patrons, and I say, he's not here. So he wants to describe that situation, one that you've surely been in when you look or anything. Ah, fuck, he's not here. Um, so the next paragraph, he says, well, it's certain that the cafe by itself with its patrons, its tables, its booths, its mirrors, its light, its smoky atmosphere and the sound of voices, rattling saucers, footsteps. The cafe has a fullness of being, right? Those are all dimensions of real stuff that's there, right? So if you took a photograph from outside of what was going on in the cafe, you could say, here's what's there. And so you could give a kind of objective description of the place. Uh, and it's true, Pierre is actually somewhere. He's not there. He's somewhere else. That's also a real thing. Right? Okay. Um, but, uh, so he says, but let, let's describe our, ex our experience. Right? He says, we must observe that in perception, there is always the construction of a figure on a ground. Right? So your perception isn't just a factual cataloging of objective features. Your perception is a meaningful situation of a figure against a background. And he says, in, in that, in, in, therefore, you know, 
no one object, no group of objects is especially designed to be organized as specifically either ground and figure. All depends on the direction of my attention. Right? This was the point I made about the guy running away you know, uh, from Jesus. Right? At that moment, the figure is the threat coming from Jesus. Uh, and the, his situation is organized in a way that's relevant to that. And everything else kind of falls into the background. So as I was saying, like, he doesn't notice that cow in the background or the guy with, being held onto by the guy with the red hat or the nice architecture of the buildings elsewhere. But in another situation, he could. Uh, notice those things. He could be sitting there and a guy could say, wow, I love the architecture around here. And he could look around and say, oh yeah, that's a nice building, right? You can make the architecture of that building the figure of your experience. And in that case, lots of other stuff would fall into the background. But at the moment, at, at that moment in the scene painted, that thing is surely in the background of his perception. And the figure is, is uh, the threatening guy with his stick, right? Uh, so that's what he means when he says there's no particular thing that's destined to be either the figure or the background. Anything could be the figure or the background, you know, depending on how the situation is unfolding. Um, it all depends on the direction of my attention. So when I enter this cafe to search for Pierre, in that context, experientially, there is formed a synthetic organization of all the objects of, in the cafe on the ground of which those things become the ground for the figure of Pierre, right? On the ground of which Pierre is given as about to appear. Um, uh, and that's just not going to happen. And then he goes through and describes it. Like he says what it's like, right? He, uh, each element attempts to isolate itself. Uh, like I kind of look around, but they just sort of fall back because they're not Pierre, right? Um, he gives a nice little description there. I witnessed the successive disappearance of all the objects. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so in the next paragraph. But Pierre is not here. Uh, that does not mean that I discover his absence in some precise spot in the establishment. No, in fact, Pierre is absent from the whole cafe. His, his absence fixes the cafe in its evanescence. The cafe remains ground. It persists in offering itself as an undifferentiated totality to my only marginal attention. It slips into the background. But it makes itself ground for a determined figure. It carries that figure everywhere in front of it and pre presents that figure everywhere to me. And what is that figure? The absence of Pierre. So it's remarkable that um, the sort of objectively speaking, everything is, is a presence. Everything is an actual being, right? But perceptually, it is an absence it's a non-existence that is the, the correct that's the correct way to describe what you are experiencing so experientially the object you are dealing with is an absence even though objectively speaking everything around you is just a presence right and you would misdescribe your experience if if you simply said oh i'm seeing the tables and chairs and so on of the cafe. That's not really what you're seeing. Experientially, that's a poor description. What you're seeing is the not being there of Pierre, right? And that's the same as saying, when Jesus is coming at you, what you're experiencing is a threat, right? Or it's the same as saying, when I am playing music, what I am experiencing is the unfolding of the music, right? That is the object of my experience. That's That's the the correct way to describe what my experience is about, right? There are, there are conditions that make that experience possible, like the other patrons in the cafe, the tables and chairs, and all the other things we would say about those paintings or my experience and so on. But, but I would be misdescribing the form my experience is taking if I were to say that those things were the object of my experience. And the crucial thing here is that notion of figure and background, right? That the form our perceptual life takes is the engagement with meaningful figures that have the consequence that other things are not the salient or relevant features of our experience. Um, and uh, I'll just read one more thing here, right? Uh, a few more lines down. He says, but to be exact, I myself expected to see Pierre and my expectation has caused the absence of Pierre to happen as a real event. The absence of Pierre is a real event and it it that real event happened uh, in a way that can't be defined or explained apart from my experience and that's very much like what i was saying 
when I was saying, you know, you're walking down the street and all these things about your parents or whatever are sort of, they reflect your possibilities in the sense that that's the meaningful structure of your situation only because you bring expectations, goals, and, and sort of those things with you, right? But, but even though those things are coming from you, you experience those things as the relevant form of the world. Um, uh, so that's that's enough that's enough for that so that's what I, I wanted to read those two passages first uh, two passages those two portions first that selection from around page 74 or so and this selection from around page 40 and 41 um, to introduce us to the description of the form our experiencing actually takes and you know Sartre's book is uh, being a nothingness uh, what's the subtitle here not on the cover a phenomenological essay on ontology. We're going to talk about ontology in a minute, but the thing I want to get at right now is that it's a phenomenological essay. Right? This is a work of, of phenomenology, and phenomenology is the description of experience. Right? It's a, a philosophical uh, approach, method, that is uh, oriented towards describing accurately the form in which our experience unfolds, and you know from that various consequences and conclusions follow but the but the the uh, methodological demand is to describe experience in the way it actually happens not to have a theory about it not to have a, your own guesses or beliefs about what's causing it but to describe experience as it actually unfolds and that's what we've just been involved in we've been describing the immediate form of our lived experience and the most the most uh, important uh, notions were this one that I started with on uh, uh, 74, that the consciousness of man in action is non-reflective consciousness, consciousness of something, and the transcendence with transcendent which discloses itself is of a particular nature. It's a structure of exigency in the world, and the world correlatively discloses in it complex relations of instrumentality. So the consciousness of man in action is non-reflective consciousness of the structure of exigency in the world. Right. Um, and that's then basically the same point he makes when he says the immediate is the world with its urgency or um, uh, the, the idea that we discover ourselves already involved in things. OK, so that's uh, and, and then from the other reading on 40 to 42, the idea that our experience takes this form of a relationship of figure and figure and background, which is implied in those things from 74 and so on. So with that description in place now, I want to go back to the introduction of the book, uh, back to page 11, uh, where Sartre is going to uh, uh, describe the very nature and the very meaning of consciousness. So we said here the structure of consciousness is that it's always of structure of exigency in the world, right? We're always um, thrown out into a world, directed towards a world. Well, now uh, back on pages... Um, 11 to 17 and then right after that 23 and 24 we're going to he's going to describe he's going to take apart uh, that notion of consciousness of um, so uh, we can turn to that now <clears throat> 